Um, so I don't believe in long introductions, just to uh, thank Professor Yashiro, who's a very good friend. Uh, it's his, he's already spoken several times at TUJ, so we're very happy to have you again. And you came to hear him, not me, so the floor is yours. So, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, it is my great honor to have a chance to share my view uh, with an uh, excellent audience on uh, Japan's new immigration policy. Uh, actually, um, this is a rather major policy changes by Japanese standard. <laughs> See? And uh, many journalists and also opposing party criticized Japanese government that uh, they change this policy in a short notice. But uh, actually, Japanese government uh, have been criticized to change things too late, too small. So actually, I took the press criticism as a compliment, because this is the first time Japanese government make a very quick step uh, to change the policies. And uh, so today, uh, sorry, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, here are the major points of the immigration policy. Uh, I'd like to talk about the three things. Sorry, I distributed only the major part of the uh, my slide. So just uh, how do you say use it as a supplementary devices and uh, first uh, let me talk about the japanese demographic situations as a background for new immigration policy second uh, uh, this major revision uh, from the former uh, immigration law uh, is necessary because the former law was not consistent between the official guideline and actual practices which we are going to discuss later and uh, finally, additional policies are urgently needed to supplement a new immigration policy. Well, uh, well I should have said before that uh, I was uh, asked to give testimony to the committee in the uh, lower house uh, last year. And there are several experts uh, recommended by various parties, uh, both uh, leftist and rightist. But uh, the view of the experts are almost the same that uh, this uh, new law is uh, uh, quite important and it's in the uh, favorable directions. Be but only uh, this law is not enough. Uh, actually, uh, there are more supplementary rules or uh, procedures needed in order to protect the uh, foreign workers. And, uh, but the, from the politician's viewpoint, because it's not sufficient, this law shouldn't be uh, passed the diet. That's, that's the opposing party's view. But our view is, although this is not sufficient, we should change the law and, uh, how do you say, work together and uh, try to supplement the necessary divisions. That's our views, okay? And... Uh, uh, before that, let me briefly talk about the Japanese economic uh, situation. This is a long-run uh, development of the uh, growth rate, most, most, almost uh, three stages. And uh, maybe this is uh, better uh, to understand the real situation. This is the United States uh, GDP. It grows constantly. And this is Japanese uh, GDP growth on dollar basis. It's stagnated for many decades. This is a China's. It developed so rapidly, and in 2010, uh, it exceeds uh, Japan's GDP, and is continuously going on. So actually, uh, this is what we call the lost decades of uh, Japanese economic development. And uh, why Japanese economy is so stagnant? Uh, there are a lot of theories, but uh, uh, the major one is uh, demographic uh, uh, changes, so-called uh, dependency ratios. Uh, this is a young dependency ratio. Red one is an older dependency ratio. And the total one is simply adding up uh, the two. And uh, this uh, declining dependency ratio period is matched with a high rate of economic growth. And this period is a medium rate economic growth. 
And uh, maybe uh, this one is uh, in the coming for the quite, uh, how do you say, slow or uh, almost zero economic growth uh, period. Of course, it's so simple explanation, but actually that demographic uh, uh, situation uh, changes uh, Japanese economic uh, circumstances quite a lot. And uh, having said that, uh, declining population is a quite serious issue in Japan. Somebody said that, yes, Japanese population is declining, but uh, it's so slow paces. Actually, this blue one shows a, a change of the Japanese population uh, started from 2000. And it increased and decreased, but uh, still it's a quite modest change. But if we look at the productive age population, 20 to 64, the decline of the population is enormous, you see. And so uh, the gap is only because the uh, elderly population is still growing, but they do not contribute to the economic development. So if we focus on the uh, productive age population, now we are almost close to 2020. Uh, compared with the uh, year 2000, where uh, this uh, decline of the uh, productive age population started, there are almost, uh, uh, how do you say, 10 million uh, population were lost in just 20 years. So it's an enormous effect on the Japanese economy. And uh, that's why, our, uh, despite of the uh, quite sluggish economic growth, uh, unemployment rate declined as uh, low as uh, 2.1 uh, or 2, and uh, job uh, offer to job seeker ratio is uh, historically high level of 1.6. So actually, it's a very, how do you say, uh, tightening labor market condition, despite uh, very slow GDP growth. And uh, foreign workers, yes, foreign workers are increasing quite a lot. And uh, nevertheless, it's only account for the 2% of the total employment, but it accounts for the 40% of the increase in the last decade. It's an enormous uh, gap between the two. And uh, so this is a net increase in workers in the last decade, uh, total employment and uh, total foreign workers. So in the marginal basis, foreign workers contribute a lot to the increase of Japanese employment, okay? And uh, most of the increase in foreign workers are unskilled jobs because uh, it's uh, uh, highly skilled workers like uh, professionals accounts only for the 20% of the net increase in total foreign workers. And this is not consistent with Japan's immigration policy we accept, we welcome in principle the foreign workers with highly specialized professional skills, but not the unskilled workers. But nevertheless, what we experience is an increase of uh, uh, low-skilled workers, mainly for trainees and students working in part-time. So actually, this is an uh, important point. Our, our immigration policy is only for the pro professionals, but actually, de facto, uh, the opposite thing is happening. So this has to be changed, it, it, something. So this is a kind of uh, tables I made myself. Uh, the vertical axis is a flexibility in jobs and the uh, horizontal axis is a longer stay to this direction. So there are uh, foreign people or with uh, uh, legal status and uh, they can work, they can uh, have uh, any kind of jobs they want, just like a Japanese, and they stay for longer, uh, almost uh, forever. So actually they are uh, quite similar uh, to normal Japanese. And second comes the professional uh, skills. And they have, uh, uh, they are okay so long as they stick to the professional jobs. But for example, English teacher cannot uh, play the role of taxi driver. It's not pro uh, allowed. It. So, so long as the English prof professor stick to their jobs, uh, they are quite free to do whatever they want. And uh, so that is a uh, uh, special knowledge and skills. And uh, these special activities are rather uh, 
new ones, and uh, that's based on the EPA, Economic uh, Partnership Agreement, vis-a-vis -vis Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And uh, this is a bilateral trade agreement, and uh, since Japan want to export uh, uh, automobiles or uh, uh, color television to those countries, but those countries have not enough product to export to Japan. So instead, they demand their workers, caregivers, or nurses to work in Japan. So there are quite exceptional cases. And uh, here comes the trainees. Trainees, uh, they are not, uh, they are coming to Japan in order to get the special skills. Uh, and uh, after three to five years, they come back to their country and uh, use their skills for the development of their own countries. And uh, here comes a student, foreign student uh, working in, uh, can, they are allowed to uh, work in part-time job up to 20 years a week. That's a kind of uh, overall picture of our uh, working visa in Japan. And uh, there are various special skills on, on the professional jobs and technical intern program. And this is a quite, uh, uh, the kind of work uh, that causes a lot of uh, uh, frictions. Why? Because uh, this is uh, originally aimed at international contribution by transferring skill to the developing countries. But they are de facto guest workers program in low paid jobs that do not teach technical skills. And uh, actually, uh, there are a lot of problems with that. And uh, also, this idea is rather quite uh, uh, not realistic. For example, there are many Vietnamese people working for the Japanese shipbuilding companies, but there are no shipbuilding industry in Vietnam. So how can they use their skills around in Japan to their own country? So after five years stay in Japan, they have to leave the country. Where do they go? They go to Korea, our competitor in the shipbuilding companies. And uh, so we simply uh, give uh, our skilled worker to Korea for the benefit of our competitors. And also those uh, foreigners don't want to learn Korean again uh, instead in addition to Japanese. So actually th th that's a really, uh, how do you say, uh, inconsistency of the uh, programs. And that is changed by this new law. And uh, also trainees have difficulty in changing the employer uh, who gives a training program. Because it's a training program, basically they don't have cho choice to uh, select the uh, employers. So because of the, uh, they are in the quite difficult problem because of that. That has been changed, excuse me, uh, improved uh, by the new law. And uh, also they have to leave uh, Japan after the end of training per period at maximum five years. And uh, this new immigration control law uh, creating a visa status, so-called special skills for accepting foreign workers in uh, blue color jobs. And the uh, first category, there are two categories. And the first category is, uh, is for those having a certain level of skills in 14 industrial sectors, which is to be followed, and uh, many blue color jobs, and they can stay for additional five years in addition to the trainees. The second category is a quite new one, for, is for those who are having a higher level than the first category, and they can stay uh, indefinitely just like our, our white collar professional workers. And also, they can have a visa for families. And uh, so, uh, in a, so if we add uh, these uh, new uh, categories to, uh, to the previous one, they fit uh, in just in this uh, position. The special skills category two is a similar of the professional skills. And special skills uh, uh, one is uh, similar to uh, these categories. And so actually they are in a sense transitional uh, status from trainees uh, to uh, special activities or professional skills. And uh, how to assess uh, this uh, new immigration law? First, let me say there is a serious misunderstanding, uh, particularly in the Japanese press. They often say that uh, this is a major change of the Japanese immigration policy. 
and they started accept the unskilled foreign workers. Have you heard the story? You see, but this is not true, because in reality, government accept skilled blue collar workers, not the unskilled workers at all. You see, uh, and uh, beforehand, we accept government accept only the skilled white collar workers. Now they expand to the area of skilled blue collar workers, but still they are skilled workers, not unskilled workers. And uh, also for those uh, skilled blue car workers, they have a labor mobility. They can move from one employer to another, of course in the same occupation, uh, obviously. And, uh, uh, but regrettably, the official view is that even though they are de facto immigrants, but uh, Prime Minister Abe said that uh, this is not for accepting immigrants. So actually this is a very clear inconsistency and uh, that has to be removed, but because of the populistic uh, uh, point, uh, the government cannot change that uh, because they are core uh, supporter for the LDP uh, who don't like the immigrants and uh, anyway. But this is just a lip service, I mean, so. Um, and the qualification of the new working status, uh, there are 14 industries selected uh, who cannot get uh, enough number of the Japanese workers. And those industries can, uh, uh, how do you say, attract these uh, new types of foreign workers. The specif specified industries include in construction and shipbuilding, and both category one and two. In, in, only two industries can accept the category two uh, foreign workers uh, eventually. And other uh, industries can only accept uh, category one for the time being, you see. And uh, what is also important is that they are skilled broker workers because uh, in addition to the specific skills uh, in their, uh, what is required in each industry, they need a requirement of frequency in Japanese language, uh, N4, or it's an equivalent level of the SEFA A2, that's an European uh, standard uh, examination uh, skills. Well, that's a major difference between the, because the professional skills, like American English teachers, they are not required to speak Japanese because students can speak English. But for those new uh, skilled blue cars, they have to speak uh, daily Japanese conversation. You see, that's a major difference. So in this sense, uh, this new uh, criteria for the uh, new blue-color uh, skilled workers are uh, even harder than the traditional uh, professional, white-color professionals in this sense. And uh, they, those are 14 industries. I don't know how they select, but uh, anyway, uh, in the, some way they calculate the uh, uh, the, the, anyway, shortage of the labor in each industry, and uh, so they can accept in total uh, this kind of uh, foreign workers in coming five years. And uh, major issues of the new immigration policy. Yes, uh, I think uh, there is a very, uh, how do you say, con serious problems about the Japanese administration. That is a lack of coordination between immigration agency and the labor department. It's a very long tradition for that. I don't know the case of the United States, but uh, uh, Japanese immigration agency treats foreigners and the labor department treats workers. Then what? Foreign workers, which foreign in this category? And there's a long fight between the two departments and finally immigration agency won. But uh, I think uh, it's not a good choice because the uh, Labor Department has more resources and uh, they have more knowledge, knowledge about the uh, labor conditions. And this is the uh, most, uh, I think, serious mistakes on that. And uh, because uh, what we need is uh, regulating foreigners is okay for the uh, immigration agency, but what we need is uh, regulating the employer of foreigners. That is quite important because that's the employer who often exploit uh, the uh, foreigners and uh, not only foreigners, but Japanese also as well. And uh, so th that is the role of the Labor Standard Office, who has, which has a quite strong power. 
and uh, violation of this labor standard law can be prisoned, you see. So it's a very, they have a strong power, but they are not, uh, as you say, in the front of these uh, new laws. Uh, so this has to be changed. Uh, I suggested a long time ago that uh, we should ex uh, establish the uh, foreign workers employment law, something like that, by the Labor Department, but uh, so far it's not materialized. And also we need the uh, expanding of the Japanese language training program for foreign workers and their family. And uh, actually teaching, in Japanese lang ja teaching Japanese as a foreign language, that skills are not uh, are well uh, educated in the Japanese uh, universities. And uh, there are existing Japanese language schools for foreign students. But uh, they are mainly for college educations. And uh, so that is slightly different, or maybe more different than actually needed for the skilled blue color workers. You see, they need a more practical Japanese than academic Japanese. So of course they should play a quite important role, but uh, we need a more, how do you say, uh, uh, practical uh, Japanese language teaching uh, schools uh, and uh, more uh, teachers on that. And uh, also what is more important is uh, this one, uh, equal pay for equal work principle. Uh, Maybe European people think that uh, it's a matter of course, uh, uh, but in Japan, <laughs> this is quite difficult to uh, establish because we are based on the seniority-based wages. So even among the Japanese, this equal pay for equal work principle doesn't apply because even though two Japanese work in the same jobs, uh, if one person uh, work for the company for 10 years, 20 years, and others has just arrived, there is a wage gap between the two. So, uh, so actually that's a gray zone for a Japanese standard of equal pay for equal work. We have already the law or uh, enforce this equal pay for equal work, but there is a big hole that is a, uh, uh, they count for the experience, uh, years of experience in the same firm. So actually, uh, I call it the Japanese style equal pay for equal work, which is not the same as a European or American style. So if foreigners uh, coming into the same job as a Japanese with long uh, uh, experience in the same firm, their wages may be lower. Uh, and, uh, how can we, how do you say, maintain this equal pay for equal work principle for the foreigners? That is a really, really difficult question. It's difficult even between the Japanese, so it's more difficult between Japanese and foreigners. And also we have a serious problem between regular and non-regular Japanese employees in the same jo jobs. It's uh, in the Japanese farm-based labor unions. Uh, so foreign workers, uh, have a higher possibility of uh, employed as a non-regular uh, contract, and so their wages could be lower than regular one. And in the case of Europe and United States, labor union never allows that, because if labor union allows some uh, non-regular workers who uh, work uh, in the same job and uh, accept lower wages, that will work negatively to the uh, regular workers, so they never accept such a things. But in Japan, labor union accept that because their wages are different from the non-regular workers. I mean, wages in the uh, labor market in Japan's uh, farm-based labor market is uh, separated from the market uh, wages, and the labor union uh, only protect the uh, insiders, which is. Uh, uh, membership uh, types of workers. So those non-legal workers or foreigners, they are outside uh, of the uh, internal labor market. Their wages can be lower, excuse me, than the, um, <laughs> before, you see. Anyway, so that is uh, Japanese labor market problems, but uh, that uh, works quite uh, negatively 
to the uh, foreign workers. That's why the role of uh, the Labor Department is quite important, uh, but uh, this uh, is not uh, well, uh, how do you say, treated uh, yet. So this is the uh, most important one. And uh, also there is a uh, problem uh, because many foreign workers are uh, indebted, I mean, they borrow money in their own country in order to come to Japan, and so they are suffering by the kind of, uh, uh, anyway, uh, treatment. So in that case, uh, there is a very good example in Japan. Uh, in 1956, uh, we have a international treaty between uh, Japan and Germany uh, for the immigration of coal miners. This is the immigration of Japan to Germany. At that time, uh, Japan, Japan's economy has uh, trans, uh, made a transformation from uh, coal-based energy to oil-based energy. So there are a lot of coal miners are unemployed in Japan. But uh, Germany at that time uh, already a serious uh, lack of labor force. So they want the Japanese coal miners, skilled coal miners to Germany. And actually, on the, of course, uh, on the entirely equal pay for equal work uh, principle. And uh, that uh, arrangement worked so well. And uh, Germany welcomed uh, those Japanese coal miners. And they want to continue this uh, program. But unfortunately, there are no Japanese coal miners who wanted to go to Germany because uh, of the high rapid economic growth. Uh, you don't have to go to Germany to find the jobs. But some Japanese coal miners married with German women and stayed uh, in Germany uh, forever. Uh, and that is a quite uh, successful treatment between the two. So we should make a similar treatment between Japan and East Asia, China, maybe Vietnam, or other Asian country. Uh, in both countries are responsible for that. And when the Vietnamese want to come to Japan, uh, government should, uh, how do you say, uh, make arrangement, not the private uh, uh, companies uh, in Vietnam. And that is uh, quite needed. Obviously, we have a similar treatment uh, between uh, those countries. Sorry, I didn't have time to translate, but uh, it's starting from Vietnam to India. But uh, that kind of arrangement was, uh, was not so strict and, uh, uh, compared with the case of Japan and Germany. And uh, anyway, it's a starting point. So we should make more, uh, how do you say, uh, strong uh, government versus government treatment on the export of foreign workers each countries. And uh, finally, uh, well, this is, uh, do you know this is the uh, largest mosque in Japan in Yoyogi Refer near uh, Shibuya? And uh, so, and it's made by the Turkish uh, some organization. And uh, immigration policy should not be rushed without careful and comprehensive consideration. I quite agree with that. But nevertheless, uh, it, a big push is necessary to open the door to foreigners who wish to work in Japan. And not only the quantity, I mean, we need the foreign workers as a number, but also we need the foreign workers who have a highly qualified, highly motiv motiv uh, motivated uh, people, students, and uh, workers uh, for uh, stimulating the diversity in the society. Well, unfortunately, immigrants' contribution in, to stimulate the competition in the labor market is badly needed because uh, we Japanese, I mean, uh, last week we had a, a lecture by uh, Peak Japan, on, on Peak Japan. Japan is so comfortable place to live, I mean, this century. And uh, not only the older people, but the younger people are quite satisfied. 70% of the younger people are satisfied with the current uh, situation. And because of that, uh, sorry, this is again Japanese. This is uh, Japanese students uh, studying abroad, uh, studying at the United States. 
At that time, uh, in 1975, I went to the United States uh, for graduate school, and they inc it increased to 47,000 in some time 2000, but then sharply dropped, and almost half of the level of the peak. And why do they stop uh, studying at the United States? Because Japan is so comfortable place, why don't we compete with Americans in the American universities? I mean, that kind of uh, young stars are increasing. That's really dreadful situation. So uh, we need the excellent foreign workers, and also most of the foreign workers, uh, foreign workers and foreign students are excellent. I mean, uh, they make a stimula uh, stimulation to the Japanese, uh, they get a good influence to the Japanese uh, students, and we do want to have it, and uh, not uh, also, not only college, but also in the workplace, uh, yes. And here's my publication, if you want. I mean, particularly, I call your attention, this is my short article on uh, contemporary Japan by German Institute uh, that uh, make a brief overview of the employment practice uh, inside, outside a conflict, something like that. I think it's uh, distributed in your paper, OK? OK, uh, thank you very much so far, because I was warned that to, to keep my uh, lecture at 30 percent. Uh, 30 minutes, so that uh, we can have pl plenty of time to have a question and answer. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yashiro Sensei. It was very informative, and thank you for the lecture. And you, 20 hundred hours exactly, <laughs> so you show that Showa is leads in punctuality <laughs> as well as quality. Um, so the way it works for questions is we have a mic over there. Uh, raise your hand. Here it is. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and Yashiro Sensei will recognize you, and then you can walk to the mic, which will make it possible for everybody to hear you. OK. Thank you very much. So ladies first. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation, first of all. It was really interesting. Um, I'm sure you know, but there are thousands of asylum seekers in Japan that live on either unstable visas, a designated activity visa, or karihome the provisional uh, release uh, temporary stay. And I was wondering if this new policy gives them any options to switch to, because many of them work in these fields either for a short time, because they have six month long visas, or you know um, illegally. And so that was uh, my question. Yeah. Um, that's a quite important point. Um, Yes, uh, Japan is often criticized that we don't accept uh, many asylums, um, except the case of the Vietnamese wars. You see, when uh, the Vietnamese wars end, there are many uh, uh, refugees uh, coming to Japan. At that time, uh, we accept that. But uh, um, actually, there is a, I'm not only the expert in this uh, point, but uh, uh, in the Japanese uh, refugees, uh, Japanese law concerning refugees, there is a kind of clauses. When uh, foreigners, uh, how do you say, apply for refugees, and it takes time uh, whether uh, Japan accepts or not, and during that time, they can stay in Japan and uh, doing some part time job or something, you see. And uh, actually, because of that, uh, there are many people who simply apply for refugees. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, anyway, uh, anyway, that causes a lot of problem. But uh, coming back to your question that uh, whether they apply for that, uh, not uh, directly, because uh, uh, these new categories, sorry, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, again, it's only Japanese, but uh, um, these new categories basically come from the trainees. You see, first you apply for the trainees, one year, two years, and then take an examination and become the uh, special skill number one. Or if you finish the uh, trainees for a uh, second degree, you can go directly to the uh, uh, number one. And if you, you are 
uh, uh, categorized as uh, uh, trainees number three, then they can uh, go to the uh, special skills, something like that. So in order to get the uh, special skills, uh, either you take an examination of skills and the Japanese language, uh, or a transfer from the trainees. Uh, but if you, if the refugees can take over this process, yes, you can take uh, special skill number one, but I think it's very hard for normal refugees to do that. But if they can stay in Japan, uh, they can go to the Japanese schools and uh, may uh, get the uh, uh, examination. But uh, uh, unfortunately, this new law uh, doesn't consider the refugees' case uh, quite seriously in that. So I think that's a good point, and uh, I think that should be considered in the case of refugees. Uh, that's my understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation. I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one, there is a, a very strange case in Japan, which is the case of the maids. Most uh, I mean, Asian countries accept a visa for maids to help uh, a family. And in Japan, it's extremely restricted, if I'm correct, to uh, investor visa oh, yeah. of people who are uh, basically CEOs and so forth. Uh, do you, why isn't there any evolution on this? Another question I have is, do you see some evolution from labor unions regarding foreign workers. We have seen uh, in the recent uh, past uh, a few cases where, for, where Japanese union were standing for foreign workers in very specific cases, but it seems to me extremely new. Mm -hmm. And for example, in the case of care workers, if I'm correct, Japan is short of 360,000 workers by 2025. So your figure of 60,000 Seem, seems extremely modest <laughs> and se seems to show that Japanese prefer to die than to be <laughs> cured by uh, Filipino workers, yeah, for example. So on uh, that too, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Well, uh, you're quite right that uh, uh, to your first question, uh, sorry, I don't have the exact figures, but uh, uh, anyway. Uh, from 150 years from now, maybe there are only one Japanese left or something. That kind of a mechanical calculation exists, uh, you are right. Uh, but uh, uh, concerning the labor union, if I understand correctly, your question is why Japan's labor union uh, work more actively to this uh, in foreign workers? Yeah, why some become sympathetic? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's simply because, as I said, that it's a company-based labor union. They are not only sympathetic, they are not uh, sympathetic not only for foreigners, but they are not sympathetic to non-regular workers, even Japanese. I mean, uh, well, it has a, well, it's a long story, but uh, you see, the Japanese labor unions uh, are more cooperative with uh, managers. So that's a good point because unlike the British Labor Union, they seldom do strikes because strikes simply damage, give damage to their interest because uh, they simply share the profit of the company. That is a role of the labor union. So maybe individually not, but uh, as an organization, I mean, they are not very uh, sympathetic to the uh, foreign workers or non-regular <laughs> workers as a uh, whole. And your first question, why uh, investor visa is uh, oh yeah, I, sorry, okay, <laughs> made, uh, I see. Uh, well, not necessarily because uh, uh, made visa is accepted in the special zone. Uh, maybe <laughs> it's a maybe a uh, strange word, uh, but uh, have you heard about the special zone in Japan? Uh, that is uh, simply the copy of the Chinese economic special zone. In the case of China, because China is a socialist country, but nevertheless they want the foreign capital uh, from United States, Japan, and Europe. So they made a special zone in Shanghai, Jinsen. Uh, and this district area, and then liberalize the market. 
And uh, that's a good way of uh, developing the China economy. And uh, Japan simply uh, follows the same uh, devices. And uh, while keeping the uh, traditional regulation as it is, uh, government nominated the special, special uh, zones and uh, deregulates uh, various regulations. One of them is a uh, uh, made visa. And uh, actually, uh, made visa was only available for the foreign diplomat, but now that uh, Japanese can use uh, the made visa if their municipal apply for the special zone. In Tokyo and Kanagawa, um, you can hire made visa, use a made visa in, if you live in Tokyo or something. But uh, it's a, actually, it's a exceptional cases, not a nationwide. That's, uh, so it's changing gradually. And uh, actually, this special skill doesn't include, uh, I think, made. So uh, you have to still depend on the special zone for that. So it's gradually changing, <laughs> in the, even in the case of Japan. And actually, I work uh, for the special zone. Uh, if you have more interest in the special zone, please get contact with me. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the excellent presentation regarding this, uh, uh, I mean, the immigration policy. Uh, I just want to ask uh, one question. Uh, regarding your uh, slide mm -hmm. about the project entrance of new category, you s give uh, the numbers of KR givers and so on. Numbers, you mean? No, no, not that uh, one. Yeah. Uh, KR givers, restaurants, construction, workers. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Uh, maybe this one? Yeah, this okay. is the one. Yeah, yeah this, uh, this, is, this shows uh, the uh, treaties with nine East Asian countries. And uh, the other slide uh, uh, about the treaties, uh, it shows you have already done the treaty with 12 countries. Uh, so what are those countries, I mean, uh, the, the eligible for these uh, uh, I mean, category and the other three who are not <laughs> the countries that are not. <laughs> so can uh, I think you can recognize there are 12 countries over there, and yeah, now here yeah, yeah, there's yeah. nine countries. Yeah. What are those nine countries, and what are those 12, co 12 countries? Of course, I can see it. And uh, is there any difference? I mean, uh, you are not going to give those three countries uh, the uh, Entrance about the uh, uh, this uh, uh, category. I mean the whole uh, the hotel, food, and uh, industry, everything. I uh, sorry, I, I forgot what, what what I mean by this nine East Asian country. Sorry, uh, for the time being. Uh, mm, examination of skills Japanese are required, but those uh, trainees after the examination treaty with nine East Asian countries. Uh, uh, I see. Um, maybe, yeah, this is related. And uh, India and Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka are not East Asian countries by Japanese. This, these are Southeast Asian, South Asian countries. So maybe that explains, you see, those are nine countries. You see, uh, you see. Maybe. So so yeah. is it okay if I if I add those three countries as well, uh, nine nine South Asian countries and other three uh, Asian countries? I mean South South countries, South Asian countries. Well, sorry, but uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure because sorry, I will take it uh, if you want. Yes, but yeah, uh, because uh, I'm asking this question because uh, we have uh, I'm from Sri Lanka. Oh yeah. And uh, we have a doubt about this uh, problem. I mean, they all have given those uh, uh, categories the new new policy for the uh, for the con for those countries for nine for those nine countries, and it's not given to other three countries. Can you just elaborate and uh, <laughs> if you can find a solution for this? This is our. Uh, uh, I mean. Our request. Yeah. Sorry, but it's too technical for me to answer that question. Sorry, but I'll check it. Um, yeah. If you send an email, maybe I'll send a, 
the answer when I found it. And my email is address is uh, not here. Okay, so, uh, or just, uh, I'll just say, write it down. My email address is simply n-yashiro. Yashiro is the same as uh, this one. And uh, at mark, uh, SWU, Showa Women's University, dot ac dot jp. It's a common for other universities. Okay, yes. So, uh, well, thanks again. So my question, the, the question is, so overall, I do believe there are issues with the new immigration law, but I do believe that it's a big improvement to the current, current system yeah. where it's just, um, you know, there are many people who claim they're students and yeah. who claim they go to school, but they actually don't. And uh, there are schools who are not really in the school business. Mm. They are in the labor intermediate yeah, yeah, business. Yeah. And then same thing with the trainee. You know, they are only nominally trainee. Mm. So, so given the current system, I still be, although there are a lot of uh, issues with mm. the new law, yeah. I do believe it's a big improvement. Sure. Do, you think, do you think so? Or <laughs> you, do you feel, no, 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 it's actually it could be even worse, mm -hmm. or you, you, you feel that the, because of this new system, mm -hmm. there could be a lot of uh, new problem, you know, mm -hmm. which Japan is currently do not have. So mm -hmm. that's one, that's a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another is more like a comment, the very last slide you had, yeah. you claim that uh, Japanese people are happy in Japan. <laughs> well, there are other empirical studies which actually say Japan is one of the most unhappiest uh, <laughs> uh, you know, country. So I'm not sure about the left-hand uh, chart. On the right-hand chart, well, as an economist, I, I kind of feel it's, it's just uh, yen is so weak, you know. Uh, yen was very strong in like, uh, late, late 90s, so that the students could afford, and the parents were mm -hmm. able to afford to send their kids abroad. Nowadays, yen is so cheap. I kind of think that must be one of the big factors, but uh, what's your view? Mm -hmm. So two questions. Yeah. Thank you. Well, this I quoted from the Prime Minister's office, and it's a rather uh, large number of samples. And uh, there is a criticism, yes, of course, but uh, nobody said that, as far as I know, uh, this new law makes the things worse than today, you see. Actually, there is a a uh, lot of improvement. For example, uh, there was only, how do you say, visa status for high professionals before that and special activities. And there are big division, of, uh, division between those uh, high prof uh, well treated foreigners and uh, quite, uh, how do you say, uh, that, how do you say, uh, low, low skills ones, and which are not treated so well. So actually, by adding this new status, there is a way that trainees can be moved upward. Uh, and if you, you are really have a highly higher skills, you can move to special skills number two, which is exactly the same category of the professionals. So there is a way to move this, uh, uh, moving the, uh, upward in the uh, foreigners' uh, classes. And that's one point. And also, the major problem with the trainees is they cannot change jobs. I mean, they cannot change the employers. If they want to change, they have to go back to their own country. But this time, the special skills, uh, number one and two as well, they can move, uh, uh, they can change the employers. And uh, that is obviously a, a large improvement, and that's uh, every expert uh, point out. And obviously, there are a kind of uh, criticism on that because uh, uh, you see, those trainees cannot move, so they had to stay in the countryside, uh, rural areas. But now that they can move to uh, or move around, they may concentrate in the Tokyo, Osaka, larger cities, 
and uh, that doesn't help the labor shortage of the rural area. That is a major cri criticism on these uh, schemes. But uh, that's from side of the employers, not the benefit of the uh, workers. So for the benefit of the workers, I think this new system is obviously good. And uh, of course, there are not enough uh, protective measures. Uh, still, there are bad employers, and uh, there are not uh, good enforcement law. Uh, to uh, keep the interest of the foreign workers. That has to be improved. So thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Ian. I'm from Vietnam, and currently I'm a third year university student. Yeah. And I'm working on my undergraduate thesis, which focused more on the trainees and how their life have been in Japan. Yeah. And one of the things that I found through my interviews is that actually, when they came here, Many trainees work in a, in a kind of job that is totally different from what is written in their contract. Mm. So even if they try to, I mean, gain the qualification, that qualification should match the one in the contract. Mm. But in the field work, they didn't work in that kind of field. Yeah. So it's really difficult for them mm. to succeed in getting those kind of qualifications, mm. which I think also proof the fact that if the trainees cannot gain enough like qualifications, they cannot move up the ladders. So they cannot become a special skills. So with that point, do you think that this kind of new type of visa will have like really influential impact on the trainees' life? And the second question is that what I learned so far, the trainees has a lot of difficulties in this current system of like I mean, hiring new trainees to Japan. And this new type of visa does not do anything on the current system. Mm. So do you really think that it will help the trainees, or is it just a kind of way for Japan to hire new workers, high-skilled workers, and they still, I mean, underground, hire some low-skilled and low-paid workers? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very good question. And, uh, Yes, uh, this new law by itself doesn't change very much for the trainee's position. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, this trainee's program uh, has been changing, uh, uh, not related to this uh, uh, new uh, laws, that is, uh, more uh, stronger supervision on the smaller companies, smaller farmers. And uh, actually, the trainees program, uh, there are two types of trainees. One is uh, managed by large companies, uh, large companies which have uh, branches in an uh, Asian country or uh, others. And uh, ideally, they train uh, uh, East Asian workers in Japan and send back to them in their own country and uh, 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 use them as uh, managers because they run the skill uh, in Japan and uh, uh, they use the company use the skills in the branches in the East Asia. And that is the best uh, combination of the specific skill. But unfortunately, many employers uh, which use the trainees are uh, small companies or uh, farmers. And uh, in that case, as you say, that there are a lot of misuses of the training program. And the government is trying to, how do you say, enforce uh, that uh, uh, adequate uh, procedures are made. And if uh, that employers are really bad, uh, exceptionally they change is uh, uh, employers uh, in that cases. But also uh, that is not enough because of the lack of uh, resources, uh, those areas. So that imp imp system of trainees uh, should improve by any means, and it's uh, going on. But this is, uh, in a sense, independent of the uh, special skills, uh, or how do you say, formulas. And actually, you are uh, right that uh, the, the before establishing this special skills, training system must be uh, changed. 
uh, that is uh, one discussion I had. But uh, uh, actually, one thing, one merit for the special skill one is, uh, in a sense, it's a, a, I, I, they establish a kind of exit of a trainees program. And so that uh, the current employers uh, for the trainees, if they want to uh, want the trainees to stay in Japan, they have to uh, treat exactly the same as uh, the special skills. That is a, a kind of merit uh, indirectly to this of this new schemes. But uh, you are quite right. We have still many problems with the trainees program that should be improved. Okay. Uh, thank you for your lecture. So uh, I have a question. Uh, in one of your slides, uh, we have a data, I think slide four, like uh, the uh, foreign workers account for like 2% oh, yeah. okay. of the total employment. Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, I think the, the new immigration law started in uh, this year, April. So uh, do you have any forecast data or, or like your opinion about like in, four, uh, in five years, like uh, how the percentage would be? And uh, do you think that the increase in uh, the number of foreign workers will have an impact on changing the uh, culture of uh, Japanese corporations. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> we don't have enough data, as you said, that it's only started uh, this uh, April. And uh, actually, because we have a such huge uh, employment, uh, Japanese employment, so it's so difficult to raise this 2% to 3%. But uh, the rate of increase, actually, uh, foreign workers accounts for a, a quite uh, large number. So I'm sure that uh, this will, uh, the new law uh, affects eventually, but uh, it takes time. As I said, that, uh, it's so difficult to uh, apply for these uh, new skills from uh, abroad. Uh, so the most rational way or orthodox way is uh, from uh, moving, uh, as you say, from trainee program to this uh, special skills. That is a major rule. So in that case, uh, it uh, comes only gradually uh, affected. But uh, 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 nevertheless, the foreign workers number will increase uh, through trainees and uh, foreign students' uh, cases in addition to this uh, uh, special skill. But anyway, it, ta it takes time. And actually, uh, excuse me, where it was done. And this uh, data uh, is uh, for five years, coming five years, I think, uh, uh, up to 2024. So it takes time uh, that this number will added to the foreign workers. So anyway, uh, it doesn't have so significant changes uh, because of this new law, actually. But uh, I, s I hope that the establishment of new law should give the, how do you say, uh, expectation of current uh, unskilled foreign workers in Japan, that they can stay in Japan if they work very hard, and uh, they can uh, stay and uh, for a permanent visa eventually. And that is quite important. Uh, so far, they have no future uh, for those trainees. And uh, so in that sense, I think it's more like, uh, as you say, uh, uh, not a quantity basis, but uh, I think it should encourage uh, 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 trainees or uh, students uh, working uh, in Japan. And actually, there is a kind of suggestion for those uh, trainees who worked for Japan for five years, and uh, why don't we encourage them to go to school, maybe the uh, two years college or something, so that they can, uh, it's more easier for them to uh, go up to the uh, ladder of the foreign workers. I think uh, that kind of uh, uh, subsidies or scholarship uh, can be, uh, how do you say, uh, considered. That's a kind of discussion uh, going on, but uh, nobody, still no fixed uh, conclusion was made. But uh, is that okay, you see? Sorry. Thank you very much for your lecture. My name is Aki Koimai from Showa Women's University. Um, I would like to ask you about your, your suggestion or um, forecast about the 
impact of this new law to the um, skilled blue uh, color Japanese workers as well as unskilled Japanese workers. I hope uh, same job, same uh, ways, practice would prevail. Um, I hope these all, all these people's low wage or working poor problem will be uh, getting better, improved, I hope. And my second question is the cost of the inclusion or a diversity of the Japanese society. Uh, for those companies who accept, who would accept the uh, foreign workers, that is quite natural to pour some channels, some educational money mm. uh, to raise the awareness of the inclusiveness inside of the company. Same goes to the education. Mm. Uh, if they accept the family of the workers, um, probably the school will provide some special uh, good courses, but the thing is, in the uh, very aged Japanese society, what about the uh, community residents, like older people, or uh, uh, how, how can I say uh, the uh, the residents people who are detached to school or companies and so on, uh, who have to provide such money, probably the tax or um, what do you think? Mm, I see. Yeah, that's a very important question. So maybe I'll answer in the reverse order. Yes, um, who pays the money for education like that? Well, one possibility is employer of the foreign workers because they are benefited by uh, employing the foreign workers and uh, they should pay for the uh, living cost uh, for education uh, uh, and also if they take families, then uh, education of the children is quite important. And uh, actually, currently, there are not, not clear system uh, for that. And the local authorities uh, mainly pay the burden. But uh, I think uh, uh, local authorities should charge those employers of foreign workers some contribution to that. That's one idea. And particularly in the local areas, uh, foreign workers are concentrated in certain city where uh, factories. Uh, and at that time, uh, there is a kind of, uh, how do you say, uh, some uh, uh, negotiation between uh, for, uh, local municipalities and uh, uh, employers who employ the foreign workers. And actually, in the first question, if uh, I, uh, how do you say, uh, if uh, many foreigners are coming into the uh, same job with Japanese uh, uh, low, low educated people, what's the impact on the Japanese? I think that's a very serious uh, one. And uh, actually, uh, there is some empirical studies on that. And, uh, uh, yes, and uh, uh, their group of economists uh, estimated uh, using the uh, data on the uh, prefectural level, and uh, they find that uh, cr those co foreign workers working for the uh, factories are not crowding out the Japanese workers or in the, in the reverse, because foreign workers tend to uh, uh, concentrate in the large cities or local area with manufacturing industries. And uh, uh, as for the latter case, average wage of those areas tend to be generally higher than elsewhere, which means that uh, because of the uh, certain volume of the foreign workers, the factory can uh, continue to uh, managing. Otherwise, they have to move to East Asian countries. So, uh, so long as uh, uh, factories uh, can survive with uh, foreign workers, they can uh, create an employment opportunity for the Japanese as well, uh, as a service sector like that. So in that sense, particularly in Japan where labor force is declining seriously, foreign workers can create a job or maintain the job of Japanese, particularly in the lower educational level, uh, factory workers like that. So in that sense, uh, so far, uh, there are no crowding out uh, effect. Unless, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, much more uh, volumes of foreign workers are coming, but so far, 
uh, such kind of uh, uh, consolation is not needed anyway. And this is, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's a kind of data for share of foreign workers by uh, prefectures. And uh, Tokyo, oh, that is the most important, but uh, Gifu, uh, Shizuoka, uh, Mie, those are the uh, cases for the manufacturing factories. And also, let me say that uh, not only for that, uh, uh, the most important area is, uh, 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 excuse me, <laughs> there are a lot of, uh, I forgot, but uh, anyway, uh, most uh, uh, industries where uh, uh, serious labor shortage is, uh, uh, where is it, uh, anyway. Uh, caregiving industries, because uh, Japanese uh, uh, companies, uh, yes, uh, more women, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, because of the aging of the Japanese population, uh, uh, the ratio of those who need uh, nursing care services are actually increasing tremendously. And uh, those industry uh, still, uh, even currently, they, cannot get enough number of caregivers. And uh, of course, uh, the substantial way of changing uh, this uh, industrial nature is needed, but uh, uh, foreign workers are not substitutable for women under severe labor supply conditions. And actually, they do need uh, foreign workers, and those foreign workers cannot uh, replace the Japanese workers, even the uh, middle-aged women like that. So far, we can live with foreign workers uh, in Japan, where labor force is uh, shrinking quite rapidly, yes. Any student from Showa? <laughs> um, thank you for the presentation. Can you please go back to the slides that shows the criteria, the two categories? Criteria, okay. Uh, Criteria, this one? Or no, I think. This one? This, this is the one before. <laughs> the one before. Before? The ones that explain the two new categories. Two categories? Yeah. Which one? Uh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed. I'm just a little confused on um, how can you get that certification. So, for, from what I understood, there are two ways. One, you either get it in your native country, or two, you change that category from a trainee status to the skilled oh, I category. I, I, I yeah, that's uh, where my confusion is coming from. So is there a, I'm, no, there's one uh, in English where you specified um, this new two types. New two types. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, okay, so uh, your question again, please. So can you explain how can I get the certification to be qualified as those workers? Two. So to be qualified mm. as one of those two new categories, mm -hmm. what do I need to do? Do I need to get the certification in my home country? Or can I switch from the trainee status to this new skilled labor status? Uh, I don't think certificate for from your own country is not needed. I think uh, uh, now that you are in Japan and uh, uh, you're a college student, I think. I'm not a student. Yes. But uh, for college student, uh, I mean, college student. Uh, you are employed uh, by Japanese companies. OK, so this new system is for the people who are already in Japan. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. no, uh, it's, it's a question. Is this a system for people who are uh, already in Japan? I see. Uh -huh. And uh, those people who are already in Japan as a trainees. OK. OK. So there are three categories for trainees based on their skills. And uh, uh, eventually, they take an examination or uh, for the trainees uh, with two years of experience, they automatically move to uh, special skills number one. And so actually, it depends on what kind of skills you get as a trainee or an English, Jap Japanese language fluency like that. So actually, uh, the, the, this system uh, 
try to, how do you say, uh, encourage the uh, state trainee people to, uh, how do you say, upgrade their skills to uh, in, inside of Japan, you see. Okay, understood. Yeah. So, so that is, uh, uh, I think, for the benefit of trainees. They don't have to come back to their own countries, um, for, uh, I mean, reluctantly or something, uh, you see, anyway. Uh, so some people complain that uh, this is against the original idea of the trainees. Uh, the, those training pro program are for the benefit of their own country. But uh, I don't care for such criticism because it depends on the will of the trainees. If they want to go back to Japan, it's, uh, it's okay. But then if they want to stay in Japan, there is a way that they can uh, uh, continue to live in Japan. And uh, so that is a quite important uh, step. Uh, for the benefit of trainees, I think. Right, yeah. Thank you. Um, I had another question. Yeah. What do you see as the largest obstacle for this to succeed? Like, what is the definition of success? And is that the language barrier? Yeah. That people cannot, for example, fulfill the language requirements? Yeah. Or is it society not accepting these trainees? Or what do you see as the biggest obstacle? Thank you. Well, uh, Japanese language fluency is quite uh, uh, objectively scored, and for the uh, skills uh, in each industry, they set a certain kind of uh, qualification for skills, and uh, it's not a matter whether society accepts or not. It's based on the skill levels. I meant realistically, from your experience, yeah. what do you see as the largest obstacle? Like, is it is it language? Is it they not being able to complete? the trainings for some reasons, mm -hmm. or by society, I meant, because you started the presentation by saying that this caused a confusion within society because people thought that the law would you know, allow mm -hmm. more unskilled. But if you explain to the society that it's actually for skilled people, mm -hmm. that perception might you know, change. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, what this, yeah. Yeah, but uh, whether one is qualified at a certain skill level or not is not judged by the employer. It's based on some objective organization. So in that sense, you mean uh, uh, whether you are liked by employer or not, it doesn't matter, I think, if uh, it's your question. Sorry, I, I don't understand uh, fully for that. Anyway. Uh, um, okay, let's put it this way. Do you see this go smoothly or do you see this fail for some reason? Well, oh, I, I, I see what your point. Uh, you see, this system looks quite well, but actually, I mean, the major obstacles uh, is that uh, bad employers survive, you see, because of the lack of enforcement power by the government, uh, but the employer keeps the trainees uh, in their own companies, and don't that, don't let them, how do you say, take an examination, something like. Uh, so it's that's on that's the reason why I said that the role of department, uh, labor department, is so important because uh, immigration office they don't have enough resources to look at uh, the employers, and the labor department can you see, and uh, actually. Uh, when they make a survey of uh, trainees, 70% uh, of the small companies uh, make some kind of violations uh, in the current law. But it's the same for Japanese uh, workers as well. Uh, when they were started to uh, come to the small companies, uh, even though the, all the workers are Japanese, Still, 70% uh, of the uh, companies uh, make some violations. So actually, uh, it's a matter of small companies uh, which uh, doesn't follow all the rules. And uh, so that's why we have to strengthen uh, the uh, enforcement mechanism of labor department, whether Japanese or foreigner. Uh, it's not a matter of foreigners. It's a matter of Japanese workers as well. So that is uh, actually, um, so this foreign workers problem is closely related with the Japanese workers problem. And foreign workers are quite vulnerable position uh, the, among the uh, Japanese workers. So they are more affected by that. 
But anyway, uh, it, the enforcement problem uh, still exists inside of Japan, you see. So um, anyway, your point is quite important in that sense, yes. And I personally suggested in my, I'm a member of regulatory reform committee, and uh, why labor department's enforcement power is not enough? Because they don't have enough resources. So I simply suggested to use uh, private uh, human resources, like Shakai Fukushishi, Shakai Hoken Fukushishi, something like that, to check the uh, employers, uh, small companies, and that was uh, uh, already uh, started, that program was started to some extent that supplement the enfor enforcement mechanism of the uh, government, labor department, anyway, it's a small step. Uh, th thanks for a great presentation. Yeah. Um, I am uh, from Sweden and uh, live in America where immigration is uh, a very controversial mm -hmm. political uh, topic. Here, this law seems to have passed um, without much controversy. And I'm wondering um, whether you see that changing uh, in the future, whether it will be more seen as more controversial as awareness rises. And um, uh, you mentioned um, social friction uh, as a potential mm -hmm. problem. Um, what do you think the government can do to, to um, avoid uh, the kind of um, immigration backlash that um, no, yeah. has happened in Europe and, and uh, America? No. That's a quite important question as well, yes. Um, fortunately, so far, we don't have such strong backlash as in uh, Germany or other European countries. And, uh, yeah, but there is a possibility, obviously, when uh, there will be more foreign workers. But, uh, well, but uh, I think it's a kind of a myth that the uh, Japanese doesn't like foreign people, actually. <laughs> because uh, the, uh, in the long history of Japan, uh, well, whenever there is a war in the peninsula of Korea, Many refugees come to Japan, you see, and uh, they are welcomed by Japanese, and uh, actually they are, how do you say, um, merged with the Japanese. Uh, there is a story that uh, one of the Akoroshi, do you know, uh, is a non-Japanese origin, something like that. But anyway, uh, uh, it's a matter of pace, you see, and the current pace of uh, a Japanese uh, uh, acceptance of uh, which one? Uh, uh, this is uh, quite uh, small, and I, sh I think this should be expanded. But uh, I think uh, um, I, um, well, try to follow the example of Germany or other cases. We have to make it. And, uh, yeah, key point is the Japanese language, yes, and that is quite important. And uh, so we have to train the Japanese language teachers uh, as soon as possible, and uh, that is uh, quite important. Susan, dozo, Um Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, like as you said, the new immigration law aims to like improve the current situation of shortage of work workers in Japan um, by upsetting more skills blue collar workers. Workers, so as long um, why, like my concern is that like as long as they work in Japan, like some of them may like because they are high skilled, and some of them may get the um, permanent residency stage in Japan. So it means that after they are retired, they have rights to share the social welfare mm -hmm. such as the national mm -hmm. uh, insurance or like other welfare um, conducted by Japanese government. So compare with with. Those like white collar workers, th um, those blue collar workers may not have enough time or money to prepare for their like retirements. So it means that they may like be the potential group of people who um, get or like have to live rely on social welfare system. Um, do you think it's worth it to like fix the current so uh, shortage of uh, blue workers? 
and then like increase the burdens of Japanese um, social welfare system and economic, like as, especially when there is such a big problem of need of nursing care. So do you think like uh, to fix the problem right now and then like increase the problem uh, in the future? Mm. Yeah, again, it's uh, quite uh, difficult problems. And uh, yes, uh, now we uh, uh, accept and import uh, young foreign workers, but they are getting old eventually. And uh, actually, and they have to be taken care of just like uh, Japanese elderly people. And uh, so, sooner or later, the current uh, Japanese welfare system has been changed. That's another topic, you see. And uh, uh, current Japanese welfare system has a lot of problems and uh, quite low price level, and so that uh, uh, there are not enough supply of uh, uh, social services. And uh, so that cannot be solved by immigration alone. So immigration simply, how do you say, uh, uh, moderate uh, that sharp drop of the uh, the productive age population, and uh, uh, that cannot solve all the Japanese problems. So we have to change our social system as soon as possible, and uh, not entirely depend on the foreign workers. Foreign workers cannot solve all the problems. I, I, let me repeat, and uh, so actually it gives some time to change our social system, and that is uh, what uh, we expect for our foreign workers. Okay. Um, we have okay. time for one more short question and okay, a short answer. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Um, I have a more general question about the Japanese immigration system. For example, uh, in, in Japan, it takes typically for PR, it takes 10 years. There, there are some exceptions. You can shorten a period of time, but it takes 10 years to become PR in Japan. And it only, but it only takes five years to, become a, to go through naturalization and become a citizen. So my first question is about why is he have, why is that discrepancy exist? Like, know your what your thoughts about that. And two, do you see? And, and also third about the uh, the lack of the inability to do dual status, be a dual status citizen, where you can't be, for example, American citizen and a Japanese at the same time on oh, the Japanese yeah, law. Yeah, yeah. And so my question is kind of how did that all come up briefly? And second, do you see that change? Do you see that system changing? Hmm. PR, for those who don't know, means permanent resident. Yeah, um, that system has been improved, but still, <laughs> I mean, uh, not as rapid as other countries. Sorry, but I'm not expert on that area. Yeah, but uh, for the double nationalities problems, um, well, Japanese government is quite stick, you see. Uh, when you matured uh, after age 20, you have to choose uh, whether Japanese or others. And uh, we have a problem with uh, very good female te tennis players on that. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I think, uh, yeah. And uh, finally, OK, uh, let me just one, uh, one minute. Uh, uh, for our temple students, uh, I'm sure there are some. Um, there's an invitation to my class if you want. Uh, now you are coming to Showa Women's University from uh, September. We have a class on uh, October uh, 10, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, Friday, and uh, the course is offered in English, and there are other courses offered by Imai Sensei. And, uh, so please look at carefully uh, the kind of uh, the curriculum of Showa Women's University. I'm sure there are some curriculums you are interested in, because there is a huge uh, imbalances of trade between Showa Women's University and Temple. There are many people who want to go to Temple University, but not Temple University students want to come to Showa University. But anyway, uh, I hope it's an interesting course. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiro Sensei. This is a wonderful presentation. You know, I think on dual nationality, it's a kind of don't ask, don't tell, <laughs> because I know many Japanese who have two passports, yeah. and as long as you don't do it in your face, 
It's, it's like the NHK fee. You have to pay it, but if you don't pay it, nothing will happen. You, so thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, thank you also for inviting your, our students to your class. Uh, I made it a policy in college never to go to class before 12 noon, but, I'm too old, but our students are much more dynamic. So thanks again. Uh, we look forward to so, uh, seeing you on the campus. As you know, we're very poor, so we can offer you a bottle of water as an honorarium. But thank you very much, and please uh, give a big hand to Professor Yashira. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.